Hello, everyone. Welcome to SciBeats Powerhouse Prospectus. My name is Chris Blask. I'm the Vice President of Strategy at SciBeats. And with me today is Bob Gorley, who's the founder and CTO of UDA, which is based on the Observe, Orient, Decide, Act structure uh, that came out of the U.S. Air Force. Welcome, Bob. Thanks for joining me. Oh, no, thanks for the invite, Chris. So where are you in the world? Do you want to say a little bit about yourself? Where you yeah, I'm, uh, I'm based in the D.C. area, a little bit to the south and west of D.C. in Manassas, Virginia. Um, and UDA is a consultancy that I formed with our mutual friend, Matt DeVoe, uh, about two and a half years ago. And we do a lot of cybersecurity work. He and I go way back. Um, I first met him maybe in 1997, um, 1998. Department of Defense was standing up new cybersecurity capabilities he had this kind of, you know, offensive hacker kind of um, approach and attitude, doing lots of red teaming. And I was on the defense side as a, an Intel officer doing Intel support to computer network defense. And so, you know, went our multiple ways, worked together on and off through the years and formed UDA uh, to continue to make positive changes in the cybersecurity domain. Well, it is fun to maintain all those rela relationships as, you know, as folks should know, you know, I've been spending every Friday with with Matt and Bob and a crowd of folks. Uh, it's turned, turned into my favorite end of the week, um, having conversations like this, right? And so I know we can go in a lot of different directions. I've got a couple of questions as usual. Um, this should be about a 10, 15 minute conversation and it could go anywhere uh, given folks like us here. So, but Bob, you know, first thought, right? You know, so we're all talking about supply chain security. You know, it's my, my day job and it's been, you know, there's a nonprofit uh, Linux Foundation thing going on in the open source. And we have presidential executive orders and blah, blah, blah. So software bill of materials or supply chain security as a whole, you know, is this thing, how real is this from your perspective? Is this yet another wave or does it differ? You know, um, things come in waves. Uh, terms get associated to these things, and sometimes it sounds like hype. People get tired of the terms eventually. We may all get sick and tired of the term supply chain security, but it is so very important. Um, if, if you get tired of the term, call it something else. I don't care, but you have to think through the trust in your systems, and you're not building everything yourself. You got to have trust in what other people give you. So trust in what others are delivering to you is critically important. I think the right term is supply chain security. Uh, it makes a lot of sense and helps bring our focus to that. And it leads directly to this concept of SBOM, the Software Bill of Materials, which um, is a way to help understand a key component of trust. And I think this is, this is not hype, in my opinion. This is serious and a positive change. A little more context on that. As a computer um, security guy, I'm sure you've seen this. People will come up with a new idea, a new approach to make a difference. And in the computer security world, usually when you first start briefing that new idea, um, all the naysayers, everybody just crosses their arms like this and say, oh, that'd never work. We thought about that four years ago. And here's why it didn't work for us. And um, when I first heard SBOM, maybe I did a little bit of that myself. And maybe that's a healthy thing. I was like, eh, no, 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 it never worked. But then soon I started to kind of lean forward in this different body language. And it's like, oh, tell me more. And we really quickly got to that stage with SBOM where um, lots of people realized that this is a way to make a difference, a positive difference. And it's not going to solve world hunger. Um, it's not. Um, the only thing you need to do, but it can make it harder on the bad guys. And you can make it harder on the bad guys without being too hard on yourself. So it's changing the economics a little bit. Yeah, I won't try to nail you down on this one, but uh, but it was on your call that I first said this a, a couple of months ago, you know, that the, the 20s, 2020s are the last decade of cybersecurity, right? You know, it's an argumentative point. There will always be conflict and so forth, but I think we're nearing the end of suddenly discovering a whole vast realm of cybersecurity that we actually haven't done anything with, like all of supply chain. Um, but, it, you know, so both the inevitability of it's a finite space, right? There's, we can't, a thousand years from now, we're not going to suddenly be saying, has anybody looked at identity? Um, 
all, but also the resonant themes, right? You know, this, this sort of thing, I was, was going to ask you, the early experience in the nineties, right? You know, for me, I see the same things coming up over time. That's when I think they're inevitable. They'll reach maturity at a certain level. We're only so mature now, but in the nineties, as you look at contents, inventory, what do we have from the government perspective? That was probably a theme then too, right? Mm -hmm. You yep. couldn't do it. Yeah. Listen, there are, there are themes from the past in cybersecurity that I think are relevant to here. And I get your point about security is changing for sure. But I, I do not think it's going to change so much so quickly, unfortunately. Now, I want to keep an open mind. Um, you know, uh, anthropology is what you have to study way before history, before things were written. And anthropologists tell us that it used to be wherever humans were, there were cannibals. Is uh, and they can tell because there's bones that have like you know scrape marks on them and teeth marks on them on every continent, and humans don't do that anymore. See, we change. You know, now it's taboo. Could it be that uh, cyber attacks and cybersecurity and cyber espionage is going to change dramatically in a way that like you know humans don't eat each other anymore? Well, humans don't cyber attack anymore. No. No, nope, no, nope, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think for as long as there's going to be human beings out 10, 20,000 years, for as long as humanity goes, there's going to be bad people and good people and people trying to seek advantage in cyberspace and do whatever they can um, to violate rules and gain unauthorized access and conduct espionage and sometimes attack and destroy. Um, and I would just say there's a, a book written in 1986 by a professor, James Carse. Um, he talked about in game theory, uh, there's infinite games and there's uh, the, these closed world games. And an infinite game is one where um, there's no boundaries and no rules. It just continues forever. And cybersecurity is this infinite game. I believe it will never, ever, ever stop. So it will not be like humans getting rid of cannibalism. It will be with us forever, in my opinion. Well, yeah, I, but I think, you know, and I think there's a point inside that to really peel apart, right? And I, I found myself raising this on your calls and other you know, forums like that and trying to define the space cause, because I think we're a bit rutted where we say, look, it's been this way forever. It keeps going on and on. But, you know, if we got all take the opposite case, could it be worse? Yes, right? You know, we could definitely do this worse. That means it's variable, right? So we're probably not doing it the optimally possible, so we can probably get better. And I think we can get better to the point that what we're seeing is cybersecurity attacks right now basically aren't happening because right now it's happening because, oh, there's open ports on everything. Oh my God, there's a, you know, oh, you know, it's literally just someone sitting there and directly taking control of things. That's a finite uh, issue. I agree with you completely though. Conflict is conflict. Yeah, what we see with disinformation and influence campaigns and so forth uh -huh. using the technical structure, you know, that's the kind of thing that never goes away. It hasn't gone away for thousands and thousands of years and won't. But maybe there's niches where things improve so much that in that particular domain, it really is improved. Like one example would be credit card fraud. I remember in the early days, I mean, it was horrible. It was horrible. Right. And if you lose your credit card, you don't get another one until weeks later. Well, these days, credit card fraud has been reduced to where it's just, it's it's noise. And if you do happen to have some credit card fraud, you get another card like that. And and it's no expense to you, hardly any expense to the bank that catch it so quick. So it's almost been eliminated. Well, and this is, I mean, the most inter interesting thing to me right now is supply chain security. You know, both because it's inside, you know, it's the visibility part of the, the ICS ISAC situational awareness reference architecture we put together 10 years ago, which is the same as and same as, right? You know, it's the inventory. What do we have? Do we know? Do you know? Do you know how much you know? You know are you certain of your certainty, right? And even if you're uncertain about things, you're uncertain about how, are you certain about how uncertain you are? And and we're actually there now, right? And it's it's the, the cards falling into places, individual efforts, you know, so great people out there have done good things to make it happen now, but we're about at this point anyways. And now, we have this visibility possibility where people can, you know, organizations, individuals and organizations can really see what they're actually agreeing with each other on and how it worked out as it works out forever. And that level of visibility maybe does structurally change it. You know, I, you know the kinds of attacks we have now, you know, OT monitoring, you know, having 
sensors at all in your operational technology networks 10 years ago was a crazy thing, which meant that every, you know, at every con, you know, it's somebody saying, I'm plugging into a router, here's a industrial control network, I'm scanning the network, I'm finding things, and I'm like, shouldn't someone's, there should a light should go off, right? Yeah. 8 million new packets. Um, so we advanced beyond that. But that's what fascinates me right now. And, but I talk to supply chain security all the time. What really is the most fascinating thing to you in your professional life these days? You know, uh, I think it could be the supply chain uh, domain because let's think of another way to look at this. You know, there was the SANS top 20 security controls. Now it's the CIS top 20 security controls. They've had them for quite a while. I think this is a great list of, uh, it's my one of my favorite compliance frameworks. Uh, what's number one and two on their list? Uh, they say that you need to have an inventory of all authorized and unauthorized software in your enterprise. Uh, that's number one. Number two, you need an inventory of all authorized and unauthorized hardware uh, in your enterprise. Both of those are easy to say, and we're finding out extremely hard, almost impossible to do. Well, with things like SBOM, it's, you make it a bit more achievable. And so now it is possible to at least get closer. And when you have that foundation, now you can put other tools on top of it and help with the other controls. So I think that is very critically, critically important. But it's also important to have that comprehensive view. You, you need far more to uh, make things you know, harder on the adversary and make it so um, your risk is manageable. There's so much inside. This is the stuff that really gets me wound up uh, right now, and it all connects together. You know, it was it was early two years ago um, in uh, uh, in Guyana with with the, uh, the the one and only Tim Roxy, and looking at this little country that's in a certain situation, they ran into a lot of money, and you know they have a huge exposure. And among the things I couldn't say is there's there's really no way you know or had to say is there's no way to know what's inside any of this, right? And and you're building it from scratch and you may have the funds, but there isn't in the world the ability to, for you to say, you have to have this in, you know, tell me what's inside this. Um, and that had to exist. So the, the, uh, the, but the complexities, right. You know, what, what, what excites me in the, the digital bill of materials, the D-bomb thing, you know, the, with Medi, Medi and Tazari for the last two years, we're at the state right now where I can see software bill of materials being offered by a provider to somebody else and have a contract attached to that that says, here's how much information you get until these clauses met these conditions. And when they are, the moment they are, you get this other information or this other thing happens. Mm -hmm. And instead of, you know, uh, Paul, I'd love to have uh, Paul Rosenquist, you know, call up to, to him. I'd, I'd like to talk policy, you know, and this would be a great forum for it because it's about the contracts and relationships between organizations. That's all it is. You know, the tech, technical stuff about what, what's in a software bill of materials and whatnot will work its way through. But that's where we get the visibility. And that's what fascinates me right now, because it's yeah. the enacting all the policy stuff we've talked about forever. All right. And so let me, uh, you fired another neuron I want to mention, and that is a uh, recent, very recent development is a uh, blockchain technologies, this distributed ledger, uh, where for a lot of reasons, it's an immutable ledger. And there's a couple different big implement implementations of that. One is Ethereum, which is uh, also besides a distributed ledger, gives you an ability to write programs on this distributed ledger. And you can create things uh, called smart contracts. So when things automatically uh, meet a criteria, that contract is executed. And it's, um, it, it fits with this SBOM kind of construct, I think. Um, you can have smart contracts that are informed by what you've got and what you know you've got and what you asked for. And I think this does give me great hope and ability to make improvements in our uh, risk equation. Well, here's the use case that has uh, risen out of the DBOM work that I think spells it all out. And, and with the uh, National uh, Manufacturing Institute of Scotland, um, that there's been a DBOM POC and so forth. And you can see how um, a manufacturer in the UK that's making blades for Rolls Royce engines, you know, to sell to Boeing, to put into airframes, to you know, assembled in, in the EU in France, and sold to uh, uh, the Turkish Air Force. You know, it's a real supply chain uh, that exists right today. And if there's ever a crack in that blade, or it comes up, there's a question about it. Can you tell me the software that was running on the radial forge that made that one blade at that moment? And you can. 
In fact, and you can have that smart radial forge that they have in the lab right now, actually write the software bill of material and the temperature and everything else to a, an attestation channel, like a debun channel, blockchain or whatever it is. And that could just pull up right away. As opposed to let me call my boss and begin the investigation, right? And that just fundamentally changes things, right? Yeah. So which leads into my last thought. So looking at a couple of years, you know, do you see anything different about the next, you know, however you want to frame it, you know, two, three, four years, five, 10, 20, or yeah, there's, what do you see? There's a, it's a very exciting world we live in right now. There's so many technologies that are advancing uh, exponentially and they're interacting with each other to give us fantastic capabilities. We've already mentioned several. On the security front, there's a lot of developments like SBOM. Uh, there is this uh, a, a cryptocurrency and blockchain related technologies, but there's so many others. I think uh, the things occurring in uh, biological sciences are just phenomenal. It could be that the greatest discovery in human history is mRNA and the ability to do things with mRNA. Um, and this is very exciting stuff. And all these technologies are kind of uh, converging and interacting with each other. It's just an extremely exciting time to live. So over the next 10 years, how will cybersecurity play out? Um, I think it has to help defend all these other technologies. Like we really have to defend our uh the technologies around the human genome for a couple of reasons. One, if you violate my DNA privacy, you violated my privacy and the privacy of every one of my current relatives and every descendant I have out into infinity. And we haven't wrapped our head around that yet. Um, and maybe that's just all going to be violated for everybody. Um, so that's one security component. Then there's the security of intellectual property, which is still extremely important. And frankly, in that community of the biological sciences, it's not being paid enough attention to. Uh, we see that too frequently, unfortunately, but it has to. Well, all this excites me. And we go on and on. There's other technologies. Space technologies are, are developing so rapidly. The cost of launch has gone down and you know there are now cleaner launches and ideas for even, even cleaner launches. Um, and so space is exciting. The moon, when I was a kid, the moon was a rock. It was just a big rock. Well, now they have discovered there's actually ore on the moon and there's frozen water. There's ice. Um, and so uh, Project Artemis with NASA going to the moon and land on the South Pole. How exciting. Um, now, imagine this. Um, our humans, uh, the first women on the moon, first men on the moon in, in this millennium, they land on the South Pole. As soon as they land, their heads up display pops up a warning and says, all of your systems are now locked down for 100 Bitcoin. We will release your flow of air to your uh, personal uh, unit. Now, what would you do? Uh, we need to think about this stuff because, frankly, I have read the specs for the the, the, uh, the astronaut uh, uh, suits for Project Artemis, and cybersecurity is not in there at all. So exciting times in security coming. Well, the amazing winds for Tao and I are going to have that conversation next week. And we were talking about uh, the supply chain issues of alien warp drive systems because we're driving into that inevitability where, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not just uh, interesting. You, you mentioned that, but it's, it's, a, I think it's an indicator. We're literally thinking of that because that's it. We have Linux running on the Mar on Mars. How exactly? No consequences. No, really. Right. And th this is the kind of thing that drives the inevitability curves that I'm always obsessing with. We have to have solved that one at some point in the future. How, how will we have done it? So, yeah, Bob, as always, thank you so much for your time, for sharing with everybody else, and for putting together the community you you, you have that I get to be part of and, and everything you've done. It's been oh, thanks, a Chris. lot of fun talking to you. Cool. Thanks, folks. All right. Thanks.